let's get started. I'd like to turn this over to Stephen Wright. Stephen? Good morning. Um, Good morning or afternoon, yes. <laughs> or afternoon, that's exactly right. Let's see if this works. Okay. Hi, my name is Stephen. I'm a recovering benzodiazepine overprescriber. It's true. I grew up in family medicine, uh, started doing addiction medicine about 33, 34 years ago medical pain management about uh, 17 years ago. And along the way came benzodiazepines. And I did what my mentors, my attending physicians taught me to do, use them, uh, you know, probably not in excess like we've seen in other circumstances, but nonetheless, uh, as, uh, as I was uh, taught over a long period of time, and I found that uh, indeed uh, about uh, uh, five, uh, four or five years ago that a lot of these assumed, received knowledge uh, information was really untrue. And so I, I acknowledge for those of you that are benzodiazepine survivors that hung in there with us when I wasn't listening in this particular, uh, in this particular space. And just like with opioids, we have distress among individuals that, uh, uh, that have pain, that have uh, uh, benzodiazepine use, and we get confused uh, often as to which is causing the problem. Is it the underlying condition or is it the substances that we're using in and of themselves? And I want to start out by highlighting an important thing that for most individuals with Basra related problems, and that's benzodiazepine receptor agonists, because it includes benzodiazepines as well as Z drugs, as well as uh, uh, the uh, barbiturates uh, that it is related to physiologic dependence and not so much addiction. We took a look at the uh, addiction related issues, non-medical use issues. Uh, that probably is not the most important feature, although we don't have data uh, relative to the, the numbers in relation to that, but there are many out there. So disclosures, uh, primarily I'm involved with the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices. I'm involved doing benzodiazepine activities uh, in other domains as well, the Action Work Group in Colorado, NEMA Research, and some research initiatives through the Schreiber Research Group uh, and State Air Opioid Consulting. Uh, the, uh, uh, the only uh, commercial disclosure that I have, Cordon Health Solutions, Drug Testing and Pharmacy Services, which isn't relevant for our discussion today. So. Uh, today, I want to uh, have some remarks about the best practices, highlight limiting duration to two to four weeks, and then outline some basic deprescribing practices as they go along. So the best practices overall, uh, we want to encourage limiting initiation. And, and for this, uh, the supplemental slides uh, outline that, and I put that in the Q&A in chat uh, yesterday limit duration of use to two to four weeks and there's a rationale for that and then for those individuals that are on benzodiazepines uh, or related uh, substances slow safe supported and shared through, uh, though patient-led tapering to discontinue use and we'll go through some of that as well so prescribing itself begins with the informed consent and that's a standard process that we use for all uh, medications and all procedures that we provide to patients that encompasses the risks, the benefits, the alternatives. And I'm encouraging the use of a written informed consent which is uh, available uh, through the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition uh, site as well as our site at the Alliance and is authored by Christy Huff who will be speaking uh, on the panel here as well. And the other piece to this is how to prescribe benzodiazepines is really a relevant part of uh, informed consent, how these are used and uh, whether there should be, as I argue, uh, limitations on their use uh, as well. So what about the utility of benzodiazepines? Short-term efficacy has been well demonstrated and we see that in, in uh, many uh, studies in many populations. However, we also know that cognitive behavioral therapy in relation to anxiety works just as well. And get this, it is durable uh, 12 months after completion of the cognitive behavioral uh, sessions. That's pretty great because we want durability of response uh, with regards to the various interventions that we provide to patients. However, we also find that benefit often declines after that initial uh, benefit uh, is realized and that's a challenge. We have not seen in good methodologic studies long-term efficacy, and, and this is a research uh, concern 
uh, for those of us in the field, we see when we look at the online communities that indeed those communities have expressed how uh, benzodiazepines uh, have lost efficacy over time. And in fact, we see a circumstance uh, where benzodiazepine cessation actually can improve anxiety and seizures. And there are a number of articles that reflect that. And indeed, I think of this as uh, an entity that could be called benzodiazepine-induced hyperangiogenesis, but we, because we see on reflection retrospectively a cohort of individuals that get better with regards to their anxiety. And so this is the covert issue that my attendings never taught me that uh, indeed the medication, just like with opioids and opioid-induced hyperalgesia, there's a cohort of individuals for whom the substances actually create the problem intended to, uh, to help. Even so, 80% uh, of uh, those that are on benzodiazepines and Z drugs have been taking them for more than six months. We heard of a study yesterday where one third uh, on long-term use, this is one that uses NHANES uh, data uh, published in 2018. In any case, the majority of individuals are on for a very long period of time. And I would argue without a, a valid uh, uh, validation in the reflected literature. So what, what do we look at in terms of uh, best practice? And these are just some of the highlights that I think uh, I have learned uh, over time. And I think it's important to prescribe for indications only when uh, individuals are functionally impaired. Just, with like, uh, just like with opioids, it's not just the symptom in and of itself, it's whether or not these uh, symptoms result in functional impairment. And so that's uh, the uh, primary indication. At the same time, the benzodiazepines are prescribed, if they are, prescribe an alternative treatment. Uh, these very often take longer to work and while you use the benzodiazepine short term to bridge the gap, uh, bridging to the effectiveness of an alternative Rx is often the way to go. Follow up then weekly with weekly prescriptions and discontinue by week four while the other alternative uh, treatments are moving into efficacy. And then for the cohort uh, of individuals that are on long-term benzodiazepines, discontinue benzodiazepines for all that are on uh, greater than one month. Now, this is an offer that ought to be provided to individuals. It should not be forced with the exception of one thing. And, those are, and that's in the circumstance when individuals have identified uh, respiratory depression of a significant sort. And this often occurs in relation to co-prescribing uh, with opioids. And there it's really uh, imperative for us uh, to move towards discontinuations for the safety of patients. But the offer ought to be there to all individuals on benzodiazepines for more than a month that uh, discontinuation can take place and uh, for them to consider doing that. Initiate the tapering, uh, which uh, we've discussed to a certain degree already, uh, to, by reducing just less than 5% uh, of the original dose. And the reason is that there is a cohort of individuals that larger reductions, uh, and these have been described in, in studies, this cohort does not do well with a 25% reduction or a 10% reduction. And what can happen is that subsequently, if the 5% reduction is very easy and not a problem, you can enlarge on that in the prescribing uh, space but adjust this uh, tapering amount and the frequency of reduction according to individual response. And this is important. This is patient led. This, is, uh, this upends the model that we usually have where the uh, prescriber is taking the lead on all this, but it is the expertise of the patient, their individual response that really counts in terms of the amount of tapering and the frequency of tapering reductions. Listen, validate and support and it may take 18, uh, 12 to 18 months to complete or even longer than that for some individuals. Benzodiazepine withdrawal is a different animal. It can take far longer than that for other substances. Uh, even years of this, we've heard, I've heard up to 11 years and more uh, in individuals and it uh, brings to mind the possibility that we're dealing with an injury syndrome where there may be rel uh, durable uh, adverse effects for individuals over a long period of time. And, and this needs to be supported uh, as well. Symptoms can be wide ranging, severe, very unusual. They may seem to be quite bizarre, 
there's a tendency for us to think of uh, alternative diagnoses or psychosomatic processes going on. Uh, we need to evaluate as clinicians the possibility of alternative diagnoses, but not to sit there forever uh, thinking that the patient simply is in denial about an addiction which isn't there or another uh, di diagnosis that indeed is not there, but to validate their concerns. Symptom patterns uh, often fluctuate dramatically, and this is unlike any other substance withdrawal. Uh, in 1984, David Smith uh, actually introduced the concept of this fluctuating pattern. Heather Ashton uh, spoke to this in the uh, 1980s about waves of worsening, windows of relative relief. This puzzles us. Uh, these are not necessarily environmentally uh, stimulated, uh, something bad going on in the environment, uh, hopping up the, uh, uh, the symptoms uh, that patients have but they occur in these waves and windows, uh, unpredictable and uh, uncertain in terms of duration. Uh, it is usually not a benzodiazepine use disorder uh, per se. And so addiction treatment is not helpful. We hear anecdotally of individuals entering treatment centers and they are mystified by 12 step and those sorts of things because craving is really not part of their experience. They're just having difficulties with the discontinuation process. This is unlike other addiction prone substances where we often see addiction as the background for the difficulties in withdrawal processes. So for the use, you, those of you that are benzodiazepine surprisor, uh, survivors, this is not news. Uh, for those of us that are researchers, there are major questions that remain unanswered. That includes uh, really redoing all of the studies way back in the day because the methodology was off and I understand we didn't know about how to do methodologically these various studies for efficacy or adverse effects. And then the background etiology and mechanism for physiologic dependence and injury as well, as well as uh, then to manage uh, benzodiazepine discontinuation. There are a lot of uh, ideas out there. there uh, the data is quite limited in terms of the options out there as well. And then for us as prescribers, much of the received knowledge about benzodiazepines I found to be untrue. And we need to recognize this. We need to acknowledge the experience, the lived experience that are expressed by our patients. Uh, we need to check out the alternative diagnoses, but not forever and validate for these patients the reality of that. Update our knowledge in relation to that engage and allow our patients to lead. They have the expertise in their own experience uh, that drives the process for how fast to move through a withdrawal process and then to become uh, benzo-wise. That's what it means to be benzo-wise in this particular space and important to do that. And one last thing. Uh, so uh, uh, there's a quote out there, uh, pain is real when you get other people to believe in it. If no one uh, believes in it, it's madness or hysteria. Naomi Wolf, she could have just as well said benzodiazepine withdrawal experiences uh, is the same thing because indeed individuals that are in this space and challenged by uh, their uh, by their experiences and those of us in this prescribing uh, space not recognizing and not validating their experiences, this is uh, quite difficult. And so. You feel free to reach out to me uh, th uh, through my email, uh, as well as through the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Bre Best Practices, uh, and I'm going to uh, step away at this point. Thank you very much to Duke Margolis and the FDA for putting on this program.